In 2021, the Senate Intelligence Committee in Washington received a briefing from the Pentagon. The briefing centered on a paper, UAPs, an initial assessment. For months, onlookers had been waiting for this moment, expecting it to be a pivotal moment in the story of disclosure of ET contact. The paper disappointed a great many, comprising no more than nine pages. But what did it contain, and where does it leave us today in the story of disclosure? In a funny way, I think it leaves us kind of where we were before, particularly for those who had been observing and had joined the dots and had come to the conclusion that we're in contact. People like you and me would have been sitting thinking, ah, what more is going to be told us? Are the authorities going to come clean? The Pentagon has been asked to reveal everything it knows about the UFO phenomenon. So this is going to be it. The big moment we've been waiting for for 70 years since the whole topic really got suppressed in 1947 and then resuppressed in the 1960s. At last, the government's going to step up to the plate and say we've been in contact and these are our friends and these other ones aren't. And of course, that isn't what happened. The report was a nine-page, flimsy little initial assessment paper that on first inspection seemed to be an absolute whitewash. And it made a lot of people very angry because it was already in the public domain that the Pentagon had had a unit operating for 70 years investigating physical materials from UFO crashes. If that was the case and that had been authenticated by French intelligence, the, the previous chief, Alain Juillet, then there should be a wadge of papers like this coming to the Senate briefings. And instead there was this. So a lot of people were angry because it was obvious from the get-go this was some kind of a whitewash. It was only looking at data since 2004. It was only looking at data that came from official reports filed by US defense about US defense encounters with UAPs or UFOs. Why was it such a tiny, narrow remit? So people were angry from the get-go and quite rightly. And yet, within those pages, there were some quite strong statements. The report said that US defense activity is interfered with, on average, every six weeks by UFO encounters, although the paper uses the term UAPs. On average, every six weeks, they have to stop what they're doing or for some technical reason they can't continue and it's down to a UFO encounter. That's a very high rate of incidence, just defense, just on US soil. And that was just in the last 17 years. In other words, not only is the UFO phenomenon real, it is prolific and prolific in America as well as worldwide. And then another very strong statement was that there is zero evidence that these encounters are encounters with the covert technology of black ops at home or covert operations of foreign powers. Zero evidence. Senior physicists Eric W. Davis and Jacques Vallée have spoken openly about their work in analyzing metamaterials, technology engineered in zero-g outside of Earth's atmosphere, materials retrieved from UFO crashes. Their work has been authenticated by other voices, including Alain Juillet, the former chief of French intelligence. But are these admissions also a smokescreen, a distraction? or misinformation. No, I think that's absolutely true. I think they know this is off-planet technology. And that's why Eric Davis was able to use the phrase he used a couple of years ago when he talked about off-world vehicles not made on this earth. We know nothing about them and so we're investigating the physical materials they've used. I mean, that sounds 
like a moment out of a science fiction movie, but that's what he said, and there's no way he could have used that phrase and come to the press without some kind of a clearance, because he would have to sign all kinds of non-disclosure papers to be a physicist who briefs the Pentagon's unit on UFO crashes and metamaterials. So there is information there if you're looking and listening and if you read the report, but the nine pages was published, came and went. So the general public is no further forward because the press didn't pick it up and run with it. And it's been missed. So it's more like another moment of insurance against disclosure rather than the moment of disclosure. I think there was really good intent behind pressuring the Pentagon into doing that which was clearly the intention of Chris Mellon, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. And he pushed the conversation forward, but just to there, so that there's this push-pull. And I think that's because there is never unanimity in any official bodies as to how to handle the phenomenon. And the Pentagon is a community of people, some who want disclosure, some who don't want it. Uh, same with government, same with covert government. And so there was a push, and so Senate briefings happened, and then there was a pull, so that there was a real limit on what was actually spoken. Just enough so that they can go back and say, well, don't you remember, we did tell you this stuff was all real back in 2021. So I think it's another of those moments. But it does mean there is official authentication of the phenomenon, which is something we have not had in 70 years. So I will take that. I think that is significant. But is there a possibility that the UAP phenomena described in the Pentagon's UAP paper are in fact black ops at home or the covert technology of other world powers? If for one moment, the US had thought that was the covert technology of another power, it would have responded to those Tic Tacs and to our allies and enemies very, very differently in that moment. So I, think, I don't think it's a fib, but it is so far from being the full picture that it's almost a distraction. So I actually believe Jacques Vallée. I believe him. And I believe Eric Davis when they say they are sincerely investigating these materials to work out what they are and how they work. I think that's true, but it's almost like a distraction if you've concluded, and I think you conclude correctly, that at a covert government level, we're already in contact. And that's what Haim Ashed said a couple of Christmases ago. Now, he was the Brigadier General who was the Chief of Space Security for Israel for 27 years. So he's a very authoritative figure. Uh, that's his job to know. And he met the press a couple of Christmases ago and said on the basis of his work and his experience, his understanding is that we are already in contact with a number of spacefaring civilizations, that there is a body called the Intergalactic Federation, which implies a number of ET demographics sitting in council who've chosen not to disclose their presence to the general public of Earth until such a time as we have a better understanding of what space is. That was how he put it, which is very, very intriguing. Now, if he's telling the truth, and I happen to believe he is, and we are already in contact at a covert government level, conversations are going on, there may be technology sharing, so on and so forth, then even if Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis are telling the truth about examining metamaterials, that's really a total sideshow to the real story of what's going on. Because if what Haim Ashad is saying is correct, well, then I want to know, okay, who's on this federation and who's representing us? at that table, in whose interests are decisions being taken, in whose interests uh, is this being kept secret, who's in on this and where does that put you and me? Those are the real questions once you know that we're in contact. So um, I don't think it's fibs about metamaterials, I just think it's a distraction, a bit like SETI, you know, looking into deep space to see if there might be others out there 
It's a great uh, activity, but it's a total sideshow to the real story, which is, yeah, but who's already here? Who are we already in contact with? And according to our indigenous narratives, with whom have we been in contact for thousands of years? In February 1954, President Dwight Eisenhower was on vacation in Palm Springs, California. On February the 24th, in the middle of the night, the president left his resort for a visit to a nearby Air Force base. The Associated Press ran a report that the president had suffered a heart attack and died. Two minutes later, the story was retracted and replaced with an official statement explaining that the nighttime visit to the Air Force base was for some urgent dentistry. However, from that time to this, sources close to President Eisenhower have leaked another explanation. Far from an urgent dental need, the story has been told that the President was meeting with the representatives of extraterrestrial factions. And moreover, that he was negotiating a treaty. When I first heard it, I was very skeptical because I thought just on a basis of logic, what power would we possibly have at a negotiating table with a species advanced enough to get here in the first place? An agreement between us and them would be like an agreement between a mouse and a lion that the mouse is gonna get eaten. But once you realize that we are talking about multiple ET presences, multiple ET demographics, once you accept that an intergalactic federation is probably quite good language for what's going on, Hey, Meshed is only echoing what the ancients said when they talked about a sky council, such as you find in the Hebrew scriptures. Once you realize there is this multiplicity of demographics at the table, then you realize that there must be treaties and agreements being made and that our treaty with them is really about how we are positioned among those demographics. They will all be here with slightly different agendas. And this is what our ancestors told us. They often conflict with one another over their agendas for Project Humanity and Project Earth. Was Eisenhower's deal something to do with an exchange of access or of people for technology? Was there an imperative for humanity to curtail its experimentation with nuclear fission? Even casual observers of the UFO phenomenon would know that our nuclear technology is very relevant to our intersection with our neighbors. There was such a spat of uh, UFO sightings, close encounters in the wake of the detonations of the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out there's a connection. And then you start watching the topic and you discover that uh, nuclear armaments were activated and deactivated uh, during the Cold War. The nukes of the USA, the nukes of the Soviet Union, by powers that we didn't know who they are, follow the story to Chernobyl. And there is the public mass sighting reported in the mainstream press of a flying saucer situated near Reactor 4, which did not go into full meltdown somehow. And thank goodness it didn't because we would have not been able to occupy about a third of Europe had it melted down. We, it would be a giant Chernobyl zone if that had happened. So there is a connection there and you know, therefore, if you join the dots, that there are at least one or two demographics on the council very concerned about the planet and very concerned about what we're doing with nukes. There would be demographics saying we need to be more open, to be more empowering to the human race, and others saying no, absolutely not. And they will have different things that would ally themselves with human interests. So the positive take home for me of that is to know we do have some allies at the table, that there are some ET presences here who are pro-human, who in some way, shape or form are looking out for the interests of the human race. And then there may be others here 
for whom we're a total inconvenience. They're here for other reasons. They're here for what the planet can offer. And so these treaties are not just between us and them. It's a complex matrix of treaties that keeps these demographics somewhat in check. And non-disclosure has been the basis of those agreements for a long time. When people get frustrated and angry with, say, the US government, for being so secretive on contact. It's the most secretive power on earth, comparing it with other countries. And they get frustrated and can't we force NASA to tell us what they know? Can't we force the Pentagon to tell us what they know? Well, no, if the policy of non-disclosure is decided here rather than here. And so I think the Eisenhower story is really perhaps the first story we have of exopolitics of diplomacy as he had to think through where do we sit on this table for our best interests. The image of the small grey has become pop culture's shorthand for an extraterrestrial. The image is in fact thousands of years old. Some who report close encounters with small greys describe a lack of emotion and suggest that these small visitors may be merely the workforce of an even more advanced species. But who are they? And what are their cosmic origins? When you listen to people's encounters with them, it does seem that some of the greys operate for others. That they are the, the worker bees, so to speak, of somebody else, uh, they're sitting in some rather junior part of this uh, federation. And some people who've had encounters with them have found, to their surprise, that they can sometimes get rid of them and take charge of them and not do what they want. That's rather intriguing, but it makes sense if they're somewhat chosen, selected, programmed, engineered to be the ones who are taking orders. But I think the greys are actually a range of entities. I think you've got some that are like that, that um, are kind of dronish, that there, there's no sense of any interior life or emotionality to them, is what people report who encounter them. But then there are others who look very similar, yet who have a far more layered and sophisticated way of communicating where there is some sense of empathy, where there is some imaginative accessing of our own minds and thoughts and feelings as the encounters progress. So I think the greys, that's not just a single demographic. And we shouldn't be surprised to get into the language of engineered species once we realize that our ancestral narratives say we're an engineered species and that we were carefully engineered to have a very particular level of consciousness. If that's what our ancestors said about us, then it's not too much of a stretch to say, well, there are other species out there who've been engineered by their cosmic cousins, and the greys would be an example of that. Just how far back do stories of genetic engineering go in the world of ancestral narratives and creation mythologies? Well, I've come to the conclusion that most of our traditional creation mythologies from around the world are not creation mythologies at all. And a lot of them, I think, go back in the main to a period about 10,000 years ago. So I think there was an intervention at that point to assist us with how we were living on the planet, to help us recover from a planetary cataclysm and to upgrade our intelligence and our level of consciousness and awareness. But that isn't the beginning of the story because if you go to those stories in Mesoamerica, for instance, or to the Sumerian stories, or to the biblical stories, there are other layers to those stories. We've got some detail on what I think happened 10,000 years ago, but then we've got reference to something that was happening around 200,000 years ago in Southern Africa, there's strong evidence, physical evidence, for ancient gold mining. And I do believe our ancestors were involved in that. They were here on the planet 200,000 years ago, and apparently 
Our ancestors looked pretty much as we do today, except not quite as smart. Clever enough to work in someone else's mine, not clever enough to know how to farm or build a civilization. And there are references to that period in some of our creation stories. And then, on top of that, you've got references to things on a planetary time scale. References to previous civilizations that have nothing to do with the timeline we know that's full of the Cambrian explosion and dinosaurs and mammals than us prior to that. And I believe by the time you get to Genesis 11, you've read about four or five planetary resets, cataclysms at that level, that mean that life and civilization has to re-evolve from scratch once again. If you listen to these stories from out of the Andes, and I would suggest in the Sumerian stories as well, you have hints at a timeline that relates to our solar system and changes in our solar system. So our stories go way, 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 way back. They are stories of interventions and assistance that are very, very old. But certainly when you get 10,000 years ago, you're looking at what I believe is just another moment in which genetic modification is happening. And the genetic modification of us is there in stories from out of Africa, Central and South America, ancient Sumeria, there in the Bible, there in the Greek narratives, the Norse, and there's a hybridization aspect to those stories as well that is equally old. But are the world's narratives of paleocontact really the memories of encounters with terrestrial visitors from a future time? Are the ETs an evolved version of ourselves? Another possibility is that these stories of first contact are actually contact with the survivors of previous civilizations. But there are ancestral narratives that talk about the origins of us and go back to this moment of genetic modification. And they're very specific about what regions of space these other beings came from. The Dogon people identify the Sirius star system. Some Native American peoples and Aboriginal Australians identify the Pleiades. Those two are mentioned in the Hebrew tradition, as well as people from Orion. So they're very specific about what regions of space these visitors came from. If you go to the Babylonian story, you've got, I think, an amazing detail as first contact is being described by the ancestors of the Babylonians, the ancestors of the Sumerians. And what I love about it is how visual this recollection is. And this is something that's really impacted me as I've read ancestral narratives, that it is visual memory that is being curated. It's not a story that's gone around the world in Chinese whispers or a book that's gone around and been rewritten. Every culture has different language, different metaphor for reporting the same thing their ancestors saw. And this comes across very clearly when you put the narratives alongside each other. But the Babylonian account that I'm talking about is of Oannes and the Apkalu. And that moment of first contact, what our ancestors described was not, oh wow, we were so impressed with their technology and we were wowed by the tutelage they offered us. These seminars in farming were just out of this world. They didn't say that. They said, these people look so strange and their clothing was made of a fabric we'd never seen before. And their clothes covered almost all their bodies. And they didn't look quite like us. They looked like they could be half human, half fish or something. And you can hear the people puzzling over what they are seeing. Why are they dressed like that? What is that fabric? And it's almost like you can you can hear the thoughts of people as they finger and feel the fabric and say, well, this is, it's so thin, it's like the skin of a fish and it's shiny like it. What, what is this? That is exactly the kind of reaction I would expect from our ancestors who've never known anything than their little local culture in their corner of planet Earth and all of a sudden people get out of their spacecraft and they're wearing clothes that cover all their bodies. I 
find that a very lovely, touching, authenticating detail that sounds very real to me. And again, it just unpacks that these were not just ordinary people who wandered out of a cave. Hi, we've been living here for thousands of years. Can we give you some help with your farming here? They are really emphasizing the otherworldly characteristics of the beings who shown up. And when you put this alongside the other stories that say Pleiades, Sirius, Orion, as well as other places, then I think you can't write off these stories of first contact as simply cross-cultural contact. I think we really are talking about ETs. The Greek Babylonian story of Oannes and the Abkalu hint at a semi-aquatic lifestyle among the visitors. Were the Abkalu aquatic, or was it an encounter with ET neighbors who had made a covert habitation on Earth in underwater bases? The underwater connection is global. So when you listen to abduction narratives, whether it's from out of Kenya, or Ghana, or the Caribbean, or Wales, they all speak, and there are many other countries, but I just say those to say how widespread it is. They all talk about the abduction phenomenon of human beings meeting people who look incredibly beautiful, incredibly attractive, who entice them to go with them, and it's for a hybridization program, and they are taken to underwater bases. And that's where the hybridization happens. Underwater bases is, of course, part of the contemporary UFO phenomenon. It was part of what was observed with the Tic Tac encounters of 2004, something that's not received a lot of attention and public discussion. If I join those dots, we're seeing craft that can ping into our airspace from out of nowhere and can enter the ocean. If our ancestors saw that or saw people emerging from the ocean, you can understand why they'd say, are these semi-aquatic beings? Well, no, they might not be. It might just be that they have underwater bases because that's how they stay hidden. And that's my suspicion. World mythology and ancestral narratives speak of an ET layer to the governance of human society. But are the Sumerian sky people, the Hebrew Elohim, the Egyptian Akhek, the Dogon's Namos, or the Babylonian Abkalu still present? Are today's close encounters and possible covert treaties with the same powers that our ancestors described from the deep past? One of the things that might suggest that is the continuity of elites on planet Earth. Elite families that have been at the top of the tree of human society for a very, very long time. When I was a little boy, I was read a story called The Princess and the Pea. The point of the story is that a prince or a king or a queen cannot possibly marry and breed with an ordinary human being. This is anathema. And you listen to the royal stories of any culture around the world, they're very, very careful to maintain the purity of their bloodline so that royals never marry ordinary human beings. And in the past, this has thrown up huge problems because of a narrow gene pool. Around the time of King Henry VIII, some of the um, kings and queens of Europe looked very, very odd indeed because they were suffering the disadvantages of breeding within the family line. But it was the outcome of a policy that says you have to keep royal bloodlines pure, you can't breed with ordinary human beings. Well, where on earth does that come from? What it really comes from is a desire to keep power in the hands of a very few families. In 1910, a photograph was taken which included the royal heads of state of nine independent sovereign nations. Norway, Bulgaria, Portugal, Germany and Prussia, Greece, Belgium, Spain, Denmark and the UK. They are all members of one extended family, every one related directly or by marriage to one John William Friso. So you've got nine countries that think they are independent sovereign nations, but they're being run by a single family. 
How do you make sense of that? I read a book by Jeremy Paxman that talks about the political history of Great Britain, Friends in High Places. And what Jeremy Paxman demonstrates, and he's a mainstream broadcaster, he was the anchor man for Newsnight for 30 odd years in the UK. And he demonstrates that Great Britain, over 500 years, went through the Reformation, had a revolution, had democratic revolutionary legislation brought in to extend the franchise to everybody, to turn Britain into a democracy, uh, went through two world wars, and yet with all these huge seismic changes, it's still the same five families running Britain who ran it 500 years ago. How is this possible? For me, the persistence hints at the possibility that they are maintaining a power structure that was established thousands of years ago. Might the Senate briefings of 2021 be merely the prelude to more open discussion of UAPs and ET contact? Or was it simply a blip in a long-lived policy of silence and secrets? If we are sitting twiddling our thumbs, waiting for the Pentagon to give this size of a document rather than this size, then I think that's a fool's errand. If we're waiting for the moment when the President of the USA steps forward and says, my fellow Americans, I got something I want to tell you, I think that's a fool's errand. I don't think it's going to happen. But if we listen to one another, if we compare notes on what we have seen, if we listen to what our ancestors have told in indigenous narratives that the powers have tried to destroy but have never succeeded, I think that's where we're going to get the really rich information about what's going on and how you and I live in this situation. I liken shifting your paradigm to an experience of grief and having to go through the stages of grief when your universe changes. And it was certainly the case for me because I started in a place that was kind of narrow Christian orthodoxy. And then I discovered through Bible translation work that there's this hidden story in the Bible that's a summary of the Sumerian story, that it's a story of paleo contact, that we're actually an engineered species. And my cozy little worldview was blown to pieces. Now I had to go through a a grief process for that. And the, the five stages of grief, if I can remember them off the top of my head, begin with denial. Oh, that can't be right. That can't be right. I mean, I'd lived in a universe where the human race was the special and unique creation of God. Now I find we're like Dolly the sheep. That can't be right. And so you begin with denial. And then when you realize, oh, that's actually true, then you become angry. We've been lied to. We've been lied to by so many authorities for so long. I am angry with myself for not having joined these dots before, for having wasted my time worrying about this, that, and the other when it was a false agenda. There is a bargaining phase as well, which I think comes between the two, where you think, can I massage this new information into my old world view? And it turns out you can't. So you've had the denial, you've had the bargaining, you get angry but you can't get stuck there. And it is very energizing being angry, but it, it can make you bad company. And you, you've got to get over it at some point. So that the next step is depression, when you think, ah, oh, so this is the reality. What do I do now? And you can go into a bit of a funk, and then you go into acceptance, which is, what I was really just talking about, where you say, okay, all right, so this is the cosmos, so this is the planet, so this is our history. How do I then live and thrive in this environment? It is into these topics that the Eden series takes a journey probing the world's mythologies and ancestral narratives for their insights into ET contact today and in the deep past. And because our ancestors kept these themes interwoven, all the questions of higher cognitive powers and human potential. I approached 
these books as story. So I'm not setting myself up as an authority, saying I know better than everyone else. I spend most of my time really looking at the oldest, sitting at the feet of guardians and elders of initiation traditions, indigenous traditions around the world, and realizing that disclosure has been happening for thousands of years, that our traditional cultures have spoken about it openly since time immemorial, and that in their narratives, stories of paleo contact, ancient ET contact, are absolutely interwoven with the story of us in the present, our origins and our potential today, and speak repeatedly from culture to culture about higher cognitive powers and how we can engage them. And so in Echoes of Eden, I join all those dots. So it's not just about contact or populated universe, it really goes to the so what. What does that have to do with you and me and how we live our lives today? And the reason I approach it that way is I want my books to be a gateway into these topics because it's told in the way it is. It's my story that I'm sharing. It pulls the reader in, that carries the reader along, and by the end they'll say, oh, okay, there's actually something serious here for me to give some attention to. And so that's my intention, to bring more people into the conversation and pooling what we all have seen and experienced. And I think going back to the question of disclosure and secrecy, wouldn't it be a shame if our ET visitors were only in contact with covert government? Because then we really would be in the dark. But for thousands of years, our ancestors have said no, we all are in contact and it's a matter of each one of us tuning in to the information that is coming our way because our helpers want to be in contact with humans not just at a political level but at an individual level and that's part of the experience that's reported in our world's ancestral narratives.